The Exarch and our companions are gathered in the ocular, and are waiting for us to convene with them. When we enter, they are all apprehensively looking towards the new guest. This new guest is Emmett Selk. I guess he said we would see him soon. The reason he is here is because the Exarch interests him. How was he able to summon all of us from the source to the first? We are all on guard. Nobody believes a word he is saying. None of us would accept his aid even in our darkest hour. Even though he insists he meant what he said, continue to wage our war against the Sin Eaters, become the heroes of this world, and he might share with us the burden of truth. Surely this must be a more preferable arrangement compared to the constant fighting we have been doing prior. We glare at him in silence. Such a pity. Let no man say that he did not try. But we will seek him out once we grow tired of making the same mistakes. Decisions will lie ahead of us that are best made with the knowledge only those who are eternal are privy to. He will continue watching us from the shadows. For now. All we can assume is that he is trying to stop us from going on our chosen path. But this can't be true. Can it? There must be a small manner of truth in his words. If he meant to lead us astray, he would have done so without revealing himself. We must keep pushing forward with our mission even if our enemy wishes for it to succeed. With our efforts thus far, we have slain two Light Wardens. Three remain, and their locations are unknown. Therefore, we should divide our forces and search each region individually. Alizé will take to Armoring, Alphino will go to Calusia, and the rest of us will journey to Raktika and group up with Yashtola. In the meantime, the Exarch will be busy going to Yulmor itself. He has summons to enter the capital, and speak with Lord Vorthry about the recent conflict at Leda Loran. It is obviously a trap, but he will use this opportunity to speak with him, to see what he truly thinks about the world's current state. Just before we leave, he has a request for us. At Fort Job there are ruins of a church, named the Church of the First Light. They were the biggest worshippers of the light, and left the religion when the flood happened. Instead, they now worship the dark. They came to be known as the Knights Blessed, they left Lakeland for Raktika and have settled there ever since. He wants us to go here to find the tablet that may prove useful to Yashtola. We find the tablet and call out to our comrades. The words written on it predate that of the Knights Blessed, but are actually of the ancient empire of Ronka. The capital city used to stand where Raktika is now. With the tablet in hand, we can leave for Raktika Greatwood. No matter how far he goes, man cannot resist looking back on the path he has walked. The untold stories and secrets of the past can be more alluring than the promise of tomorrow. And so he braves the forests of Raktika in search of mystery and wonder, of Ronka, to which all seekers of hidden truths are inevitably drawn. The forest goes on forever, but not much of this forest is inhabitable. Emmett appears behind us. He came out of the shadows so that we could take a moment to enjoy the view together. Thancred is still reluctant to have him on our mission, but Menphilia says that if he wants to help, then he has to help us fight. No, he is an observer, not a fighter, and even in the shadows, he feels the light berating him. It is hard enough for him to walk with us right now. If we must, we will suffer his company but not his commentary. Our Ashian friend means to follow us wherever we go, even if it leads to light-ridden territory. Two years ago, the settlement of Fort Gon was eradicated by Sin Eaters. They have since labored to restore it to its former glory. Or so we thought that was the case, because when we arrive at Fort Gon, it is in the same state as it was two years ago. The settlement must have moved elsewhere. Before we can decide our next course of action, we hear footsteps approaching us. The Knights Blessed surround us with their army. We raise our hands in surrender. They believe we are Sin Eaters and try to convince them that we are not. The army starts to second guess their commands. A person asks Runa to report. This Runa refers to them as Master Matoya. They apprehended us as she ordered, but are these really Sin Eaters? But she saw such intense light that it was unmistakable. If we are not Sin Eaters, then what are we? Yashtola is taking us for the enemy, even though she can see the ether of living beings. 
does she really not recognize her companions? She recognizes Thancred, Urian J, and Minfilia of the First, but our Aether is unrecognizable. Only one creature in this world has Aether suffused with such an abundance of light, and that is a Sin Eater. But she is mistaken, for we are her dearest comrade, and in our short time here, we have slain two Light Wardens and absorbed their Aether. She tells the Knights Blessed to lower their weapons, she will bring us to their settlement, and maybe here we will have less hostile greetings. Though it is peculiar that she would see us as a stranger instead of one of her dearest comrades. While Fort Gon has yet to be rebuilt, the Knights Blessed have settled elsewhere, in a place to the northeast. Their settlement is known as Slitherbow. They are a simple people who revere the darkness itself. It has granted them the strength to persevere during these times. She wishes to hear of our travels away from prying ears, and we move to her personal quarters and recount our tales here thus far. Our next goal is to slay the Light Warden of Raktika. With her knowledge of the forest, she believes she can narrow down the search. Thousands of years ago, this place used to be the Ronkin Empire. There are many ruins nearby that are remnants of that long, begotten era. A tribe who uses lethal force to keep out outsiders fiercely guard these ruins. Therefore, the Light Warden may use this place as their home, as nobody can come to disturb its peace. The timing of the tablet couldn't have been any better. Yerstola hasn't begun to translate its words, but she believes it must contain a way for us to enter Yuxmaya safely. Whilst Urian J and Yerstola begin deciphering the tablet, she wants us to explore the city. This way, we can truly appreciate the importance of our role as the Warrior of Darkness. Whilst in the Slitherbow, we have to adhere to certain customs. They believe that the light taints all it touches. Nobody should utter their true name when under the light. That is why children take on the name of parents, or disciples take on the name of masters, just like Yerstola has. It is also custom to wash the light's taint from their skin, with water blessed by priests. From an elf known as Urzabel, she tells us the history of their people, and how their faith came to be. The first of the Knights Blessed lost everything they held dear. Nobody knew what happened to those who were reborn as Sin Eaters. They believed their gods abandoned them, but where there is light, there must be darkness. In that truth they founded a new faith, a belief that souls could find peace beyond the sunless sea. That is why they pray for the safe passage of wayward souls unto the blessed Black Abyss. They keep living for those who went before them, to keep alive the legacy they left for them, for their children, and generations yet unborn. One of Runar's men rushes to Slitherbow, stating that there are Sin Eaters to the southwest of the Grove, and it is believed that they have the Blighted Touch. Even though they know the risks, they want to go back out there because Todia's hearthstone is still missing. They must retrieve it before the funeral services. Some nights ago, a girl named Todia was slain by the Sin Eaters, they had retrieved her body, but did not notice that her necklace was missing. Heartstones are important, as they are stones given to you at birth, and stay with you your whole life, and even past your death. Both Minfilia and us are immune to the blighted touch, and offer up our services to see if we can find the Jade Heartstone for them. When out there, we can see the Sin Eaters, and defeat them. After a little searching, we do find the Jade Heartstone nearby. We retrieve it, and bring it back to Runa. Now the services can continue on as normal. We are to be honored guests at her service and are to enter the darker, a dark, eerie, but tranquil area that lies beneath the Slitherbow. Before we notice, the people gather here en masse. Even the rest of the silence join the services. Runar walks through the crowd and behind him is a child carrying the Jade Heartstone of Todia. They move over to a cauldron, which is presumably filled with the same water we use to cleanse our skin. He thanks us all for coming to pay our respects for their fallen daughter. In the light she was known as Todia, but in the dark she will forever be known as Menin. He takes the Heartstone. We entrust her to the night's sweet embrace. In darkness she will be free from pain and suffering, now and forevermore. May her soul find peace in the sunless sea of heaven. He submerges the Heartstone in the cauldron. It begins to glow. The rest of the Heartstones in the cauldron respond by doing the same. The cauldron represents the night sky, the sunless sea of heavens. We call upon you now, O bringer of shadows, to lead this gentle soul into the sea. We call upon you now, 
O warrior of darkness, to deliver her unto paradise everlasting. The service has ended, and Yashtola thanks us for retrieving her heartstone. Nobody was more passionate in their faith than Todia. She would have been moved if she knew about our presence here. They should know that we do not deserve nor seek such reverence. Maybe we do not deliver her to the heavens, but if we could return the real night sky to these people, then it would be the next best thing. Their prayers would have been answered, and they could gaze up at the night sky and see their ancestors in every twinkle of the stars. We cannot allow their hopes and dreams to drown in the light. We have to bring back the dark. If we don't, who will? They have finished deciphering the tablet, sort of. The tablet is a set of directions written down by the ruler of Ronka just before the Empire's demise. They were fighting in a war from all sides, and in their desperation, they sent out these tablets to call for aid. Etched into this tablet is a way for one to prove that they are an ally of Ronka, but they lack the means to translate this portion of the text. We need to find a monument that the children of the everlasting dark are protecting, and use it to translate the final section. The only problem is that the children are a bunch of zealots who will kill anyone on sight. Therefore, we need to sneak into the Woven Oath. For this mission, she brings us and Thancred along. We use bees to distract the children as we sneak in the other side. Eventually, we find the monument along with three murals painted on the wall. While she translates the tablet, she wants us to examine the murals and see if we can understand anything about them. We cannot really discern anything from them, that is until Ardbert appears. There was a researcher who examined these pieces. He believed the first painting, which depicted the Age of Gods, dated back to a time of myth and legends, a tribute to heroes of a long forgotten era. It was then discovered by an explorer from Ronka, who was struck by its majesty and had a second painting commissioned, commemorating the heroes of their day. The researcher said that one day they will all be here too, heroes immortalized forever. Maybe he'll even paint them himself. Ardbert thought it was a joke, but he actually went and did it. This painting is more faded when compared to the others. Did he try to scrape it off after he learned that they caused the flood? He wonders if our deeds will warrant an addition to this collection, or some kind of other monument. Yerstola interrupts our conversation as she is done with what she needed to do. When we look back at Ardbert, he is gone. With the task at hand done, we return to Slitherbow. Runar welcomes us home and asks us to sit down for a meal. He remarks that it is strange that those on patrol haven't returned yet, but he thinks nothing of it. Instead, he tells us to go get Yashtola and Urian J to tell him that the food is ready. As we approach the door, we can hear their voices in the other room, arguing about something. We decide to listen in. She tires of these games. Why does he pretend that he cannot see it? The blessing spares us the fate of becoming a light warden, but he cannot be blind to the corruption that is growing within us. We are not the same as we were on the source. Though she has no proof, she believes that the light from the wardens was not negated at all. It was absorbed. Though Urianje has given thought to this possibility, he did not speak of it, because not much was known. By the time he decided to tell us, it may have already been too late. She knows that he only has our best intentions in mind, but that doesn't make it any easier to put her faith in a man who is so infatuated with secrecy. She has had her suspicions ever since the day the Exarch made him speak of his vision. But now she must ask, the Eighth Umbral Calamity and all that followed, everything he has claimed to have seen, did he really see it? Urianje sits there in silence for a moment and then prepares a response, but just before he can say anything, a man interrupts him, shouting that the Yule Morans have come. We are under attack. Meanwhile in Yulmor, the Exarch arrives to Lord Vorthry's throne room to have the meeting we talked about earlier. The Exarch tries to start the conversation off pleasantly, but Vorthry wants to skip right past it. There is a band people are calling the Warriors of Darkness. They have slain Light Wardens, and now he hears reports that the Crystarium is obstructing his soldiers. He brought him here to ask him what does he think he is doing. The Exarch should be asking him the same thing. He knows that the defeat of the Light Warders will save their world, and yet he stands by idly and does nothing. Why? That is because the hope he clings onto is fleeting. Even if the Sin Eaters were slain, the world as we know it is beyond saving. 
With what little resources remain, the people would return to fighting to claim that which is left. They require the firm hand of God to stop them from destroying themselves. He would fulfill their dreams and desires. He will give them peace and order, and they shall never want for any more. Men are creatures who entertain the idea of things without thinking about the consequences, but a little fear can go a long way towards helping them realize their folly. What they need is sanctuary, and they shall only find that here in Yulmor. That is why the Sin Eaters exist, to unite the world under his dominion. The paradise he creates will be one which ushers forth the Eighth Umbral Era. The Exarch had always known that Vorfri held sway over those around him, but what sits before him is the result of bloated privilege and unchecked power. Man is more resilient than he thinks, his achievements are brought by compassion and understanding. This calamity is another thing that man must, will overcome. He calls the Exarch deluded. The people do not care about the future, they only care about the now. What good is a paradise if it will only happen in a hundred years? He responds that it is Vorthri who underestimates man. They can see further than he thinks, he has seen it in the Crystarium. When it was new, it wasn't much of a sanctuary. It is only because of those in generations past that those in the present can be where they are today. These are the bonds which hold man together, not the chains that Vorthri tries to bind them in. He will continue to support us hunting the Sin Eaters with tremendous enthusiasm, because he has faith in the future we would build. Vorthri grumbles, why does he even bother? The atmosphere in the room shifts, we are fools. Before he came here, he already knew his mind. He has already dispatched his forces to defend the Sin Eaters. His disobedience will not be accepted, the civilians are his to rule, his to command, and that includes the Exarch. He fires a beam of energy towards him, but the Exarch's form shimmers and disappears. He sent only an illusion of himself to the meeting instead. Vorthri is confused at first, but realizes that he has been duped and again throws a tantrum, slamming his fists into the floor in anger. Insolent swine, I will not stand for this. Do you hear me? We return to the scene of the Slitherbow. Ranjit and his men are waiting outside. Yashtola and Runa meet with them and see the injured knights blessed on the floor, showing us that they have not come in peace. Ranjit announces, by Lord Vorfri's decree, Raktika now falls under the governance of Yulmor. They will henceforth answer to them. The Knights Blessed has shunned Yulmor's friendship and they believe that they harbour hostile intentions. Therefore, the children of the Everlasting Dark have been given executive authority over the forest. Those of us that wishes to follow Vorthri's decree must make for the Woven Oath and renounce their faith. And those of us who refuse will be branded as traitors and will be treated the same as the injured man laying on the floor. The Knights Blessed cannot abandon their faith. They will hold the Yulmorans off here until they draw their last breath. But there is no reason for us to suffer their decision. Our work is not yet done. We still have time to flee. Flee? Yshtola is thinking about taking the offensive instead. She has deciphered the tablet and we can now enter Yuxmaya safely. All we need to do is find the Light Warden and slay it before Yulmor destroys Slitherbow. According to the tablet, we need to first obtain a seal which was used to identify allies of Ronka. It is hidden in an underwater cave and requires us to solve a relatively simple puzzle. We must give praise unto the snake, by its strength do our lands prosper. Be as the Opo Opo, rival thy kin, as all parts seek betterment, so too does the whole. Be as the wolf, move as one, peace comes to all who seek harmony with their kin. We must activate each of these statues in the order stated. In doing so, we are given a medallion which has an owl on it, the insignia of the Empire. With this seal in our hands, we should be able to enter Yuxmaya. We bring it with us and enter the Forbidden Land. It doesn't take long for the Guardians to find us and stop our path by firing arrows at our feet. They do not listen to our words and intend on taking our life. It isn't until Yashtola reveals the insignia to them that their relentless onslaught stops. When the Vis examines the insignia, she realizes it is genuine. They allow us passage in Yuxmaya. We should stick to the Azure path. It will lead us to their village, for no. The people here are descendants of the palace guard, which served under the last emperor of Ronka. 
They have been carrying on the duty of their forebears ever since they received the final decree from the Emperor. By the wisdom of our people was Ronka made to thrive. Such knowledge must never be forgotten, nor may it be suffered to fall into the hands of the wicked. Keep it secret, keep it safe, and look to the coming of our allies. Unto them you shall bequeath our all, and thus will Ronka live on. Their people have been waiting for this moment for over 3,000 years. They have stayed vigilant this whole time, defending Ronka's ruins and the wisdom held within. The wisdom of Ronka shall be ours as long as we wish it. We tell them of why we have come to this part of Raktika, to hunt down the Light Warden. Although they haven't spotted anything to do with it, they ask us to question their natives instead. Questioning one of them reveals some very interesting information. Her mother spotted one in these woods. Before she came to Fano, she lived in the village near Raktika Falls. While out on patrol one day, she spotted a swarm of Sin Eaters. One in particular stood out from the rest. It was larger, and the smaller ones seemed to revere it. She was convinced that what she saw was in fact a Light Warden. If this information is to be the case, then it makes sense as to why the rest of them have not sighted the Light Warden. As Raktika Falls has been sealed off from the outside ever since the bloody battle they had with the Sin Eaters. They tried to unseal it many times, but were eventually forced to give it up. This doesn't mean that we should give up hope. If we are willing to enter a more treacherous way, we can. Through a place known as Kitana Ravel, it is sealed to all except the allies of Ronka. We must first go to the Kamul Astropolis, and there we will unseal the door that leads to the ruins. There are four pillars known as the Morning Stars. Activating these pillars will open up the Great Pyramid Uxna. To investigate how to open up the pyramid, Gestola will scan the lower levels for any information, and we are to imprint any text we find on the higher levels. Luckily, the puzzle seems to be related to the one we did prior. Putting all the text together reveals yet another riddle. Come together, share despair. Go thy ways, dread burdens bear. Mark the crown, heed its call. Avert thy gaze, forever fall. The correct statue is the owl, the animal which represents the Ronkin Empire. Gestola suffuses it with ether, and that causes the door to open. We are about to enter the pyramid, but Simon stops us outside, warning us that the Yulmorans have entered Yuxmaya. We did not expect them to move so quickly. Time is now of the essence. We must complete our objective here and open the way to the Kitana Ravel. Entering the pyramid, we yet again come across another sealed door. One pedestal has an owl statue sat atop it, but the other does not. We find the statue and have to bring it to the pedestal, whilst avoiding the gaze of the other statues. Placing it on the other pedestal opens the door and allows us to enter the final part of the pyramid. We have to sneak around the ruin guards as they have a death gaze that will gradually kill us if we are caught. We have to navigate through a maze as poison slowly fills our lungs, and we have to run away from a boulder as it rolls towards us. And just when we thought we were done, we turn the corner and collide with Ranjit. A battle breaks out between us, but it seems to be going nowhere. So the V sisters coordinate an attack and hold back Ranjit as we aim for the heart of Topasa. Activating the heart deactivates all the nearby ruin guards, and we are to assume it has opened the door to Katana Ravel. At the same time, Ranjit has defeated the Vise sisters. He lunges right towards us, but is blocked by Yashtola's barrier. Then the adjutant runs into the room and triggers a trap which Ranjit jumped over. The floor crumbles, revealing an abyss that lies below us. We do everything we can to avoid falling to our doom. All of us are trapped on the edge of the platform. The Yule Moran adjutant tries to bargain with us. In his hands is an antidote which can cure the children of the everlasting dark's poison something we so desperately need after our battles against them. If we guarantee them safe passage out of this predicament, then the antidote is ours. Before we can even think about their parlay, Ranjit states that they do not negotiate with the enemy and kicks him off of the platform, into the abyss below. The antidote was in his grasp, meaning that it too is falling into the abyss. Yashtola reflexively leaps off of the platform and grabs the antidote, and then throws the antidote towards us. As she falls into the abyss, a strong gust of wind shoots upward from it. Looking down into it, we cannot see a single thing and assume that she has sacrificed herself to save the people of Slitherbow and for no. We can only feel immediate sorrow at her demise, but Ranjit interrupts our thoughts, stating that what she did was noble, 
but pointless. This angers us, and we are ready to confront him, even if it means that we fall to our demise too. But in the nick of time, Minfilia, Thancred, and Urianjay turn the corner, and see us stranded on a platform with Ranjit. Urianjay wraps chains around Ranjit and pulls him towards Thancred, who blasts him with his gunblade, knocking him into the abyss. The hardest part we have to do now is tell them of Yashtola's fate. At first they are in disbelief, maybe there is a second entryway into that tunnel, but Almet tells us that they never found another way into the pyramid, and they cannot find the bottom of that pit. If someone were to fall that high up, then… Yumet rushes over to tell us that the Yulmorans have pulled out of Fano and Slitherbo, but the blessed are gravely injured. The children's poisons is coursing through their veins as we speak. We shouldn't let Yashtola's sacrifice be in vain, and we will save every last blessed with the antidote she secured. One of the blessed we need to save is Runar. He is in bad shape, and it took three dosages of the antidote and a bit of healing from Urian J to get him into a stable and conscious condition. He is glad to see that we are all safe. When he realized where the soldiers were heading, he knew that something had to be done. He glances at the room and notices that Yashtola isn't here. Where is she? Again, we have to break the news to someone that she is gone, sacrificed herself to secure the antidote which has saved the Blessed's life. He is stricken with despair and refuses to believe it. He wants to go out there and look for her himself, but he hasn't seen the abyss she fell into. There was no way someone would survive that fall. Almet is sorry to interrupt our dialogue, but they have captured an intruder, and they believe they were one of our comrades. It is Emmet. He is curious to know what has happened to us since he departed, and we recount the tale we told to Runa. He coldly states that this is an intriguing turn of events. My condolences, by the way. It is never easy to lose the ones we love. Thancred expected him to be indifferent to her passing. He is an Ashen after all, and he takes life for granted. We think about her final moments, and we are beginning to wonder what really happened when she fell because there was a powerful gust of wind that came from nowhere. They again want us to recount the tale without missing a single detail. Thancred remembers that at the bloody banquet she used the teleportation magic, Flow, which caused the gale of wind in the tunnel right before their disappearance. Emmett backs up his assumption by stating that he sensed a brief disturbance in the life stream. He only felt it once, which would suggest she is still adrift on its currents then she may still be lost to us. If you remember last time, it took us gaining the aid of the elementals to retrieve her from the ethereal sea. We do not have that kind of aid here on the first. Emmet sighs. Oh very well, he'll go and get her. Perhaps a clear and unambiguous act of kindness will serve to win the trust we seem so determined to deny him. If Emmet is truly capable of pulling someone out of the life stream, then we have no choice but to trust him and accept his help if we want to see Yashtola return to us. He hands us an ethereal lamp and tells us to find the spot where the life stream resonates strongly. We go searching for this place and the lamp glows so bright that it is blinding. This must be the place. We whistle to Emmet and the others to come to our location. He states that this location will serve well enough and tells us to give him some space. He raises his hand into the air, and suddenly the air in front of him begins to sparkle, just like it did when we saved Yashtola from the life stream the first time. He searches for the color of her soul, and once he has located her, he snaps his fingers, which causes a blinding light to form, and from that light, Yashtola comes forth. He snaps his fingers again, and she slowly falls to the floor. He's done it. He's brought her back. This time she isn't unconscious, as she wasn't in the life stream for all that long. She doesn't even remember invoking the power of flow, as she jumped without thinking. Anything after that was almost done instinctively. She did something extremely reckless, and we'll have to forgive her for that. If it wasn't for Emmet Selk being able to navigate the life stream and pull her from it, she would have been lost forever. She thanks him. Even though we have our differences, he saved her life, and for that she is grateful. But let us move past this and return to the main goal at hand, the Katana Ravel. We have opened its door and she hopes we did not explore its depths without her. We didn't. In fact, we were waiting for her to return. 
The Empire of Ronka was a place of magic and enlightenment, of peace and prosperity. Sadly, it was not meant to last. Though naught but ruins remain, they remain heavily guarded nonetheless. The Katana Ravel is perhaps the most sacred of these sites, home to the ancient wisdom of the past. With the advent of the Flood, however, we have reason to believe that something more sinister now resides there as well. Pushing through the Katana Ravel eventually brings us to Raktika Falls, our true target. That sinister thing lies here, the Light Warden of Raktika Greatwood, a chimeric monstrosity named Eros. It was thought to be the amalgamation of several unfortunate creatures that were caught up and fused together by the Flood of Light. The meaning of its name, Romantic Love, is a mocking play upon the intimate and uncontrolled embrace which resulted in its present appearance. We confront Eros and put an end to this Light Warden. Just like every other Warden before it, the light seeps from its being and trickles into ours, which we absorb and return the night sky to Raktika once more. Yashtola fervently stares at us, our condition troubles her still. Though for now we seem stable, she believes it may only be right that we know. She gazes up at the sky and asks Urian J to paint a picture with his words. He says, A sea of shimmering stars, diamonds strewn across a raven gown, boundless and beautiful. Tis an exquisite sight not unlike that of the source. Calm, gentle, and forgiving. She can see it. Let us return home. On our way out of the Katana Ravel, we come across some murals, but they are old. They predate that of the Ronkin Empire. The paint used on the murals is something we've never seen before. According to Almet, the sanctuary was built to preserve the wisdom of the ancients. What do these murals commemorate? Emmet has joined us as he was getting bored. He has come to check up on our condition too. He is definitely plotting something, but we cannot be sure as to what it is. He looks towards the murals and states that this is a sight that would bring a tear to one's eye. He recognizes these scenes. That I do. Indeed, there was a time when anyone and everyone would. Until one calamitous day when the world was divided across ten and three reflections, sundering the land and all who dwelled upon it. And the worst part? No one could remember it. Not really. Just fragments and fleeting memories of an achingly familiar world. A vision shared of a paradise lost. Preserved only in song and scripture and paint. Once upon a time. Yet here we find ourselves again. To look, learn and remember. Then share with us the stories you know so well. We are listening. Before the Great Sundering, there was one world. A world that knew naught but peace and prosperity. Until it was faced with a crisis. Unprecedented. Terrifying. Civilization found itself perched upon a precipice, staring into oblivion. But through prayer and sacrifice, the will of the star was made manifest. Zodiac was his name, and by his grace was the calamity averted. A savior mighty and magnificent, deserving of reverence and gratitude. One would have thought, Yet some thought otherwise. From the fears of these naysayers would rise Hydaelyn. She who was to serve as his shackles. To bind him and hold him in check. And so they fought, and they fought, and they fought. And in the end, Hydaelyn was victorious. With all her strength, she smote him dealing a blow so devastating that it split the very fabric of reality. And thus was Zodiac banished and his being divided. That concludes today's lesson on long-forgotten history.
Though I imagine your mother would offer a rather contradictory account, as is her wont. I'm sorry, I can only assume I misheard. But it sounded an awful lot like you were implying both Zodiac and Hydaelyn are not gods. But... What? Not gods of the first? Is that what you thought these paintings depicted? Or... Oh... Oh... They are gods after a fashion, yes. But no different from the kind with which you are so intimately acquainted. Formed of faith and prayer, of conviction and devotion. The eldest and most powerful of primals. You have spun quite a tale. Yet you have not explained the role of the Assians in all of this. How is it you are privy to ancient secrets lost to time? <laughs> finally, finally you ask the right question. And shrewd questions warrant honest answers. We Assians know because it is our history, our story. It was we who summoned Zodiac, we natives of that sundered paradise. Now, do you see why we yearn for the great rejoining? For our world, for our people, for all creation to be made whole again. Wouldn't you wish for the same? Thancred is in disbelief after hearing those words. If they were the eldest and most powerful primals, then that would make... No, he cannot take the words of an Ashian at face value. It has to be a lie. Ariane J hopes that his words were not true, for truth is usually a matter of perspective. Yet upon this matter, there can only be one truth. That was an enlightening experience, but do we believe that there was any truth to Emmett's claims? We need to think about this once more, and bring this story up to Alphino and the others. And hopefully, Emmett will be present. Seems quite fitting that he would choose now to hide in the shadows. We return to the village of Fano, and they are glad to see us safe. Finally, after 3,000 years, they were happy to know that everything that they have lived for was not in vain. Us showing up was more than enough to restore their faith in their duty, yet to think that their knowledge had helped return the night sky to them. It is more than they could have ever dreamed of, and for that, they thank us. As for our friend Runar, he has returned to the Slitherbow ahead of us, and we go to greet him there. The Yule Morans and the children of the Everlasting Dark had fled upon seeing the night sky. They could not deny the truth that they saw with their own eyes. The moment that the light in the sky waned was when he knew that their prayers had been answered, that they were not doomed to face oblivion at light's end. When he first met us, he had harboured suspicions about us. Now he can see that he was right. We are the bringers of shadow, the warriors of darkness, the saviors for whom they have prayed for so long. We are not worthy of his reverence. However, if he were to pray, then pray for their children, that they might know a better world. They want to hold a feast for us, but we do not even have time for that. We must go, all of us, for we share the same path and the same fate. Runar accepts that Yashtola must leave, but asks that we hold them in our hearts, as they will hold us in theirs, now and forever after. By the boundless dark, this he swears. It pains Yashtola to leave, but it is time for her to return to the Crystarium. Just before we go, she wants to talk to us in private, specifically about our condition. She wanted to keep her suspicions to herself, but after witnessing our victory at Ratika Falls, she fears they may prove true. From the moment she saw us, she noticed that our ether appeared tainted, suffused with an overabundance of light not unlike that of the Sin Eaters. The light that pours into us after defeating a Light Warden is not being negated by the blessing, but absorbed into our being. Urian J suspects the same, but refuses to share his thoughts. One thing is for certain, with every warden we slay, the danger to us will grow far greater than we can imagine. If we begin to feel anything strange, we are to inform her at once. Now we should hurry on to the others before they begin to worry. 
she will catch up to us when she has organized her things. Slitherbow seems to be at peace now. Those who were blighted by the poison have made a full recovery thanks to the antidote. It is time we set off for the Crystarium, knowing that our job in Raktika is done. Returning home, we meet with the Exarch and Alphino and want to tell them of what Emmett told us. But the Exarch is exhausted from being so far away from the Crystal Tower for so long and recommends that we reconvene tomorrow. We should return to our room in the Pendants for now. Moving into our room, we examine ourselves to check for any corruption after absorbing the third Light Warden. Even Ardbert overheard the words Yishtola said to us, that there is a light sealed inside of us, but on the outside, nobody would ever know. We look the same as we did when we first arrived. Either way, we must stay the course, no matter the risks. For the others. True enough, going home isn't really an option anymore. If we don't go and face this head-on here, it will only come and find us there. He thinks about Emmett's tale. Do we think he was telling the truth? If Hydaelyn is just a primal, then doesn't that mean that those of us who are under her blessing are just slaves to her will? We hadn't thought about that. Let us pay him no mind, for Ashians are known for lying. Villains, heroes, all are a matter of perspective. One man's fond memory is another's waking nightmare. He is no saint or saviour, just another sinner, and he knows that he is in no position to judge. When he saw the people of Slitherbow look up at the sky and celebrate the return of the dark, it felt good. It was moments like that he cherished, more than the thrill of adventure, the quiet after the storm. He always took comfort in that. Meanwhile in Garlemald, Estinian is waiting under a nearby lamp for Gaius to report the information his scouts have found. There have been several skirmishes, but nothing of consequence. Both sides would not want a prolonged engagement. It is only the calm before the storm. If the Empire wanted it, it could bring an end to this war right now. This gives them more reason to hasten their search. Sadly, they are no closer to identifying their target, but some other interesting information has popped up. A general posted in Alamigo has disappeared from the front lines. It is unlikely that he is dead, and even less so that he deserted. Gaius doubts that he would return to Garlemald willingly, but a corpse could definitely be forced to return here. It cannot be Elidibus, because he would not abandon Xenos' adamant flesh. Another player has joined the game. The real question is, who exactly is this person? Elsewhere in Garlemald, we see a katana bearing centurion. He begins to speak to himself. These bloodless games make for poor sport. Mayhapeth father. Nay, I am a stranger to him in this body. Besides, there is but one hand that will make me whole again. My enemy. My friend. I know not what entertainment occupies us, but if we will not clear the way for him, then he shall seize the reins of fate once more.